Uh, my name is Jeff Silvestrini. I'm the, uh, the uh, first vice president of the league this year, so I get the, uh, the privilege and honor of, of uh, chairing this meeting. So, um, so welcome everybody. Could I, uh, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of our October 18, 2021 meeting. Have a first. Is there a second? Okay. Any discussion on that? Not all in favor? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Those are approved. Um, so uh, I guess today is a momentous day. Uh, President Biden will be signing the uh, infrastructure bill that passed both houses of Congress today. And um, that's going to be uh, good news for Utah. Uh, it's going to be a substantial amount of money flowing to our state for infrastructure projects. And um, Andrew, you want to say a word about that? Andrew Gruber, the uh, uh, executive director of Wasatch Front Regional Council. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Silvestrini. Yep, Andrew Gruber, Executive Director of Wasatch Front Regional Council. Um, briefly, this is a, a really good day for transportation in Utah. Um, after work for literally over a year, uh, the Congress recently passed and the pre President will be signing today the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Let me be clear, this is not Build Back Better. There are strong opinions in various directions about the social, so-called social infrastructure bill. They were politically tied, but then fortunately the hostage was set free and the infrastructure bill uh, was adopted. And in, in short, here's what it does. It'll provide $1.2 trillion for infrastructure, that's transportation, water, broadband, other types of hard infrastructure. It will provide stability and predictability in infrastructure dollars coming to Utah over the next five years. So think uh, state roads, transit, funding for local projects through your metropolitan planning organizations like WFRC, stability and predictability and modest increases in formula programs. And there are tons of new and expanded competitive discretionary grant programs that we all are going to have the opportunity to apply for. The rules for those programs are not even written yet. But we, WFRC, with the other MPOs in the state, with the league, with UAC and UDOT and UTA are going to be working together to provide information to all of you that you need to have so that you can be in the best position to take advantage of this bill. Uh, and uh, some advice and guidance as we go forward. So uh, stay tuned for that, but it's a good day. In the league's Friday fax email, they distributed a summary of the bill that WFRC prepared, um, and we're happy to answer any questions that anybody uh, may have up to this point. Thanks, Mayor. Okay, thank you, Andrew. And so uh, the other thing I just want to do before I introduce John Park is just to uh, thank everybody who's going to be, who's outgoing uh, for their service to all of our communities and to congratulate those of you who, who won election or re-election, uh, you know, and I look forward to serving with you uh, this year. So uh, with that, I will introduce John Park, who's going to talk to us about um, public safety and uh, tier two uh, retirement modification. Okay, uh, as far as public safety is concerned, there's, there's a lot of issues that are going to be coming up. Uh, in fact, I, we could, we could uh, get a really long list, actually, uh, potentially. But uh, some of the things we're working on right now is the Garrity. We've talked a lot about, about the Garrity decision of the, uh, the state uh, records, records committee that uh, said that that uh, statements taken under Garrity were in fact public records and uh, we don't think that should be the case. Uh, we, we, we've talked about that I think before here. Qualified immunity, there's, there's always seems to be a bill coming up on qualified immunity as far as I, I know right now. Nothing has got a lot of traction with, with, uh, with that. With uh, medical ca cannabis being allowed, in, uh, uh, being allowed in the state of Utah now, how it affects our, some of our public safety and and uh, firefighters, police, and things like that, as far as uh, testing positive for cannabis, which is a legal drug right now in the state of Utah, how that affects, uh, how that affects their status in, in the public safety realm. Uh, you know, I mean, interesting, as I'm sure you know, is, 
is uh, a lot of drugs you take after about 24, 48 hours, they're out of your system, but if you take medical cannabis, it stays in your system for up to 60 days, and so that's, that's, a, that's a difficult thing for us to do, and then there's all kinds of things uh, as far as first responders go that, that we're gonna talk about a little bit. Um, I wanted to go. I wanted to go through first of all before I got into a, a couple of uh, slides that deal with uh, with legislation. Uh, I think it's important for us to understand uh, uh, kind of where our police departments are right now, our police officers right now. In this last spring, uh, Representative Gwynn, along with Wayne Bradshaw, our office. I uh, did, a, did a survey, and that survey was police officers and public safety people, uh, firefighters, and, and we did a whole lot of people. There's something like 4,000 people in that system. We talked to about half of them. And so, you know, the, the statistical relevance of the, 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 some of the things I'm gonna give you right now are very relevant, and so I think it's important that, uh, that we, we understand what's going on, especially with some of the things I'm gonna talk about in a minute uh, as far as public safety retirement. Uh, in spring, again, in spring 2021, uh, we asked, did you, uh, why did you enter the profession? Why would you stay? Why would you leave? And, and things on morale and uh, job satisfaction. And uh, we analyzed those then through the eyes of people that were on tier one and tier two. And it was very interesting. One of the first questions we asked was, was if you were considering leaving your agency, is it, uh, is it to uh, go for, uh, to leave the profession, to go to a different agency, to leave the state, but still in public safety or to retire? And as you can see, of those respondents that are considering leaving, uh, about 45, four, between 40 and 45% of those plan on leaving the profession. Uh, of course, we're all talk, we all see jumping to different professions. Uh, go, I mean, d d jump into different agencies, which is about 30, 33 percent of those, and so I think that's that's uh, that's important for us to to know that not only are we having a problem recruiting right now, we are having problem keeping, and the attitude is pre prevalent that they need to go. Forty five percent of them that that think about leaving are uh, are going to out outside of law enforcement. Interesting enough, when we ask what are the most influential reasons that are causing you to leave the profession, if you look at these numbers, the lower the number is the most significant. And so uh, we hear a lot about uh, tier one and tier two retirement, but the two top reasons that people say that they're considering uh, leaving the profession, number one, to seek higher wages, and number two is because they do not have the support of their elected officials. I, maybe I ought, to, I ought to repeat that. They do not have the support of their elected officials. And so, so as you can see, part of that is monetary, but part of that is morale, how we're making them feel. And uh, I think that, that that kind of support is, is just something we, we kind of talk about. Re increased retirement is came in number four. And the portrayal of law enforcement in the media, in, I mean, came in number three, and portrayal of law enforcement in the media actually came in fourth. And we think we understand that the, the influences that have this. We try, yeah. Question. Yeah, I just had a. I, I guess I'm trying to understand the one and two. Um, I know, at least in our city, um, you know, two is very closely tied to one. If we're giving them more money, they yeah, feel yeah. like they've been supported. Uh, we don't have any elected officials talking about defunding the police or anything like that. So that's not necessarily why they would feel the elected officials don't have their back. So I'm just wondering, is there, how do you tease apart those two from, yeah, from each other? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you know, we, did, we didn't really drill down on those and, and we just try to rely on the data. And, and I think also a little bit of that was kind of time and place. I, I think that uh, a lot of things have changed. Uh, when we took this, it was right after legislature uh, met and because it was in the spring and, and I think that a lot of the elected, you know, that there was a lot of consternation about some of the things that was said in the legislature. I think there's uh, also uh, relatively close to a lot of the things you saw in the media about the George Floyd incident and things like that. I don't know if that's changed, but I think it's significant to us. I think the significance to us right now as we talk about legislation, uh, part, of the, part of the issue that I have with retirement legislation is not that it's, not that it's a good place to spend money, 
but maybe it's not the best place for us to, to try to consider and grow that pool of people that want to be involved, not just in police and fire, but, but I think all of you in here understand that, that uh, other kind of uh, skill positions, skills, sounds like a football team, right? Uh, so, you know, your skill positions in, in your cities like building inspectors, uh, public works people, things like that are uh, very hard to come by. And so, and so I think that uh, that's something we need, to, we need to discuss. Good question. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the questions we ask if you have $100 in new money, this is always my favorite question, you know, that we ask on these surveys. And out of the $100, uh, more than a third of it, or 38% of it, $38 should go to pay increases and 26 for retirement. I, I just wanted to kind of, you can see the rest of them. I just, wa I just wanted to kind of point this out to put, as we go into the legislative session, kind of put in perspective where, where our peace officers think they are and, and some of the legislation that you will see. The next thing, uh, are you planning on staying in public safety for 25 years? This also gets to the retirement system and probably yet yes is less than half of the people that are currently in, in public safety and probably not is about 25% uh, with kind of the, the middle 25% there. And so, yeah. Can you just clarify that of the, in these last two, for all these slides, we've pulled out the respondents who self-identified as tier two retirement employees. So the survey had both tier one and tier, tier two. That's right. And this is focused, these results are focused on those in the tier two system. In tier two cities, yeah. Sorry. Tier two, not tier two cities, tier two. Does anybody, everybody understand the difference between tier one and tier two? I think that you are all... We'll probably have, might have to explain this uh, in a couple of months, uh, but I think everybody's pretty seasoned in here and they understand the difference there. And so, yes, Mark? Sorry. Don't be sorry. Mark Christensen, Saratoga. What percentage of the workforce represents Tier 2 employees compared to Tier 1? Do we know? We do know. And uh, actually, I'll sit back there and give you, I'll, I'll get that for you, but I don't have it. Right in front of me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember? It was right at the very first to that. That daddy. Uh, well, let us pull that up. Good question. Uh, and of course, the tier one are dwindling in numbers, and tier two are uh, hopefully are rising in numbers. I. Just for a newly elected mayor, what's a tier one, tier two? What is tier one and tier yeah. two? Okay, several years ago, back in, uh, back in, uh, in the, in, not, no, that great question, thank you. Back in the recession of 2008, basically, there was, there was, a, there was uh, a lot of, uh, nationally, there was a lot of uh, tr retirement systems that were having problems. And the legislature reacted to that, and what they did is they said basically took everybody that was in a retirement system at that time and, and made them whole and kept them the same. And then for everybody after a certain date that came into a state retirement, whether it be in police or anything else, was at a different level. And so, for instance, the police, police officers used to be able to retire at 50% uh, after 20 years. 50% of their high three, of their high three, and now it's it's 35%. Am I right? 35% of 25 years, for instance, uh, and and but how what that also meant to cities is the amount of people, amount of money people, cities were putting into the the fund, so to speak, reduced as well. And you bring and you know that also brings up a great question that I'm. I'll, I'll close with, but, but uh, or a great statement is that because a lot of cities uh, were reduced in how much they paid, a lot of those, uh, you know, part of the issue became you would have two people work, working side by side and they were getting the same wage, but one was getting a lot more put into the retirement than the other. And I know a lot of cities have, have uh, reacted to that and were just, they, they just kind of, rather than put in the state retirement, which they could not by law, they increased the amount going in an IRA or, or their 401k or something like that. And so that's part of the, that also muddies the water when we talk about changing the state retirement system. Uh, tier one. 
Tier one is the, is the first group. And it not only changed public safety, it changed every, every I think, state retirement, every retirement in the state of Utah. And so uh, it did, you know, obviously made, made it more solvent, but uh, there, there is a, there's obviously fallout from that. And so, uh, uh, okay, let me just go on. Right now, there's uh, there's a, there's a couple bills that that have been adopted by committees right now that uh, that pertain to to retirement retention and recruitment and retention. This is Representative Gwynn's bill. Uh, I just let me just start by saying that we appreciate any legislature that is is trying to help us with recruitment and retention, and and we I mean we just so appreciate that. But as I mentioned that we need to figure out how to spend the money in the right place at the right time. And, and I don't know that we have a lot of answers. But currently, uh, his change right now allows a retired public safety or firefighter to go back to work after one year. When I retire as a city manager, I could not go back to a city and work for a year, uh, you know, even, even as, a, as a consultant. Uh, I, could, I could make a limited number, amount of money, but, but then after one year, it became unlimited. And so that's the way it is right now with, uh, with anyone, anyone, whether it's police or fire, if you retire and you want to go back to work, you, uh, you, you need to do that. You need to set out a year, set on the sidelines for a year. Uh, also that uh, a public safety or firefighter can re uh, retire with full benefits, 25 years of service or 20 years of, 20 years of service at age 60. Now, and the, just to clarify, if you retire right now, if you retire with uh, 25 years of service and you're only 50 years old, you can get your retirement, but it, there is, uh, they do adjust it, okay, down a little bit. So whatever has been put in there last, what your actuary date of living is. And uh, the proposed uh, uh, changes and allows them to only go back to work for after 60 days. And so you'll have people retire, tire, set out, set out for 60 days, and they can go back to work. And the other thing that it does is it gets rid of the uh, uh, 25 years, and they can they can just do it at 20, uh, regardless of age. And so that's that's a significant change. Now today in, in LELC, which is Law Enforcement Legislative Committee, we found out that. Uh, that Representative Gwynn is in fact going to change this bill, propose to change this bill to affect tier two employees as well in this bill. We haven't seen that language. We, all we've seen is the agenda. Uh, so we'll, we'll try to figure that out this Wednesday as far as, as our interim committee goes. And so uh, the other bill, Representative Birkeland's bill, uh, also deals with public safety and recruitment and retention. But she's taken a little bit different twist her twist in it is to help uh, uh, help cities, as far as we're concerned, cities in, in counties of third, fourth, fifth, and sixth class. And that it allows people to go jump back to work immediately after, uh, within 60 days, as long as they go to work in cities or, or other kind of, other kind of uh, municipalities in those counties. And so you know, uh, this would just exclude the Wasatch Front, would exclude Davis and Washington County and, and include all of it. And that is to try to get people to, uh, uh, and it also affects teachers, by the way, to try to get teachers and police officers to go ahead and serve, to retire and to go back and, and, and take that knowledge and experience back to there. Michelle, did you have a question? Mayor, did you have a question? Um, I'm sorry, okay. One of the things that, that uh, as I mentioned earlier, one of, one of the asks, one of the asks we're going to do is we're going we're to do some work and find out. Uh, when I work for Cottonwood Heights, we, we recognize the disparity in people working side by side, having different amount of people amount of money put into the retirement system, and we made the change not only for public safety officers, but we made the change for every tier two employee that we had in our city. And I know a lot of other cities do that, and I think that's a very germane. Uh, a bunch of information that we need to to uh, to get in uh, to be able to to have an intelligent discussion about retirement and the other things we need to know is is if you've raised public safety wages in the past two budget cycles, which I think that we all have, and not just in the budget cycles. I think a lot of us has jumped in in the middle and and done a lot of it 
I used the analogy, I think, at UCMA the other day that we just kind of have walked in with uh, wheelbarrow fulls of uh, cash and dumped it in our police departments, and yet we're still having thing, people jumping back and forth. Uh, we've just, we've seen, uh, you know, there's an article the, uh, in the, the newspaper, I think, a couple of weeks ago that talked about a lot of initiatives Salt Lake City are doing to try to recruit public safety officers, uh, and that's something that, that we've got to look at very closely, some of the things that we're doing right now, and then have that intelligent conversation. Any questions? Cameron, did you come up with those numbers? Okay. Thank you. That'd be interesting to know. I should have that information. I'm sorry. And that's all I have. Thank you. So lucky, lucky for the league, uh, John's version of uh, sitting on the sidelines has been coming to work for the league rather than going back into city government. But thank you, John. Okay, uh, this next matter I'm going to introduce uh, Cameron to talk to us about um, the Unified Economic Opportunity Commission and some work that's been going Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, I guess, so, so is, does anybody want to make any comments, any questions, anything like that on the discussion that we just had? Okay, seeing none, we can, go, we can move forward. So uh, Cameron's gonna talk about um, the work that he and Mayor Ramsey from South Jordan, who's the, who's the chair of the league this year, have been working uh, with uh, UEO on a, on a number of proposals, but um, the, some of the ones that are, frankly, the most concerning <clears throat> are proposals that would were initially uh, started out with changing the 50-50 sales tax uh, distribution formula, and now have kind of morphed into a uh, more of a uh, restriction upon uh, um, cities' abilities to use um, tax incentives to incentivize retail development or, or other things. And, uh, I guess what I'll say on this is that we don't need to make decisions on this today. This is really kind of uh, informative, but we will need to take a position on this as a policy committee um, prior to the session. So, Cameron. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Mayor Silvestrini. And I'll actually echo what he just said about the public safety issues that we just brought before you. So they are moving into the Legislative Interim Committee uh, this week. Generally speaking, the Legislative Policy Committee only takes positions on bills once they're, once they're drafted. In this, this case, they're gonna have a hearing this week, and we intend to bring them back for the LPC to consider either in December or at the beginning of the session. So if you're, so you see the asks that are up there right now, we'll be following up via email on these asks as we're trying to get a better complete picture on what cities have been doing, particularly over these last few months in the recruitment and retention space, because that'll help inform the dialogue at the legislature over these potential changes. To give one other quick piece of background, when John, when John was still at Convent Heights, uh, that's when tier one, tier two system, or the tier two system was created. Uh, the league supported the creation of tier two since that time, the League has supported some bills to modify Tier 2, and we've opposed some bills to modify Tier 2. In fact, uh, Mark Johnson, I'm going to put you on the spot, because you remember, was, I think it was five years ago now, we had a small subgroup of the LPC that met during the session, because Representative Cunningham had those four bills, uh, and we ended up supporting a couple and opposing a couple. The concepts that Representative Cunningham brought forward five years ago are similar to the concepts that John was just describing. So they're not exactly the same, but they're similar. So again, we'll, we wanted to, to put the concepts in front of you today so that you'll be prepared either in December or January uh, if we bring them back for a vote. So I guess I'll just ask one last time, if there are any thoughts or questions or any additional data points that you think we should gather between now and then? Okay. I did reach out to my contact at URS uh, while John was presenting, uh, texted to ask him for that data, and his text just came back here. Okay, as of December 31st, 2020, public safety and fire, this is statewide, uh, tier one employees are 55% of the employee pool, and tier two employees are 45%. That was as of December 31st of 2020, 
again, those numbers will be trending differently, and he's going to give me some additional data. So, um, John, there you go. Oh, a, a question, Isaac, please. Well, yeah, wait, sorry, I, I forgot, microphone. Sorry. Yeah. Well, so one of the things we showed saw on the board was that there's a proposal to change from you having to wait till you're 60, uh, till you can retire after 20 years, no matter your age. And then another one talked about there's just be a 60 day uh, waiting period for even the other proposal we saw. I imagine those inflate a city's monthly contribution or, or pay, per paycheck contribution in some way. Um, and it would be nice to know a percentage or a dollar amount or something to put a handle on this because you know, that, that seems to be a, a part that we'd need to absorb. And maybe that's already been done, but uh, it just strikes me to have a better handle on, okay, your increased city is going to be this much per FTE on average uh, or, or something like that would be useful to, to know. Perfect. So, John, do you want to respond to that? We can just pass the mic back. Back to him, because I saw, I saw you nodding and shaking your head at two different points. Yes, but we, we don't know. It will affect us, there's no question. We don't know how much. Uh, as far as I know, I have not seen a fiscal note on, on this proposal or the proposal that uh, Representative Gwynn will be making this week. Uh, there's no question that, that uh, our contribution levels will go up, but we don't know how much. Before we get to Lynn, let me add one other piece to this. So Jamie Davidson represents the league on the URS Council and has been a really good voice on behalf of the league when we have these, when URS is having conversations. Uh, likewise, we are responsible for every bill that goes forward that impacts cities to provide a fiscal note, or better put, an approximate fiscal note of what the impact of that bill is going to be on municipalities. So Molly, Hello, Molly. So Molly Wheeler, our new policy director who you've met in the last couple of meetings, uh, she will be our point person on assembling that sort of fiscal information. So as LPC members, we rely heavily on your cities providing us with your individual analysis, and then we aggregate it and provide it to legislators as well. So thank you for bringing that point up so that we follow up on it. Lynn. Yes, I just wanted to clarify something, mostly to make sure I'm thinking of this correctly. Because back in 2005 or whenever it was that Senator Lilenquist did this, ran this bill, they were cons the legislature was concerned about the stability of their state retirement fund, and so what they what they the the concept they they came up with was retirement should be used for when you intend to quit work and not work anymore, and not just be a basis to supplement your income and then go back into the workforce and collect retirement and income. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about who is eligible for rehire after 60 days or after a one year waiting period, anyone can get rehired. But if they want to retire and keep receiving their retirement income in addition to their new salary, there's a waiting period. So that's what we're talking about here is public safety officials who want to leave one jurisdiction nominally to retire and to accept that retirement income on an ongoing basis and then rehire with another jurisdiction so they get their retirement plus their salary. So that's what we're talking about in this waiting period. And that right now it's at one year, they're talking about shortening that to some other window of time, particularly for school teachers and for law enforcement officials because, and this reflects uh, Representative Berkland's bill, because particularly in rural Utah, it's very difficult to staff the vacancies. For the first time, uh, we're now seeing similar challenges in staffing along the Wasatch Front, but that hasn't historically been the pattern. So anyway, as long as everybody understands that, or at least, I guess, Cam, I'd ask you to confirm if I'm thinking about that right, because that's my understanding of what really is the issue here in terms of rehiring or the window of eligibility for rehire. Is that correct? Correct and correct, yep. Both the original rationale and the rationale on these bills. Okay. While you walk over here to Carson for online, uh, any other comments from those in the room? Any other questions from those in the room? Okay, so then we'll wrap, wrap it up here and move on to the next item. Thanks. We have a question online from Mayor Burton. 
he asked, we need to end the swapping of officers from each other. Will either of these proposed bills help stop that? Well, I'll leave it to Mayor Burton to ask the, the million dollar question, right? Um, so thank you, Mayor Burton, for asking that because this was the subject of a pretty heated conversation at the Salt Lake County Conference of Mayors two months ago. It was the subject of a heated conversation at the UCMA meeting two weeks ago, week and a half ago. And ultimately, if the pool of applicants doesn't expand, then we really are just competing with each other. In fact, I had somebody say to me the other day that it felt like it was retail incentives, but with public safety employees uh, with city versus city. Uh, John, take it away. I, I think Cameron just, just brought it up. When I, when I talk about uh, you know, putting the most bang for our buck, the issue is really if we, if we allow people to retire and go to work for another jurisdiction, what is that doing to bring people into the profession? I mean, I, I think that there will be a little bump because some people uh, that would retire and go somewhere else perhaps would stay in the profession. But in reality, what we need is more people. What we need is more people of millennial age coming into the profession. We need to find a way to, to provide opportunities for them at all levels of our, of our government, uh, of our local governments. And unless we, we have some kind of way or a plan uh, to do that, uh, we're not going to solve the problem. And so that's... That's uh, part of the frustration. I don't know, you know, what impact we'll have on this retirement. I, I've, and I know that uh, there is a significant difference between Tier 1 and Tier 2. And I, and, uh, but I don't think that what my personal opinion, and you'll obviously get a chance to vote on this down the road, my personal opinion is we're not doing, we need to find ways to bring people into the pool to be able to, to not just, you know, put a layer on top of, of, with some more experienced people in, in the public safety realm because they're, they will eventually retire and go away. We need to find young people that are willing to come in and be police officers, firefighters, building inspectors, those kind of positions. Perfect, okay. <clears throat> oh, Carson, far away. We had one more comment online. Um, Cliff Straken asked, or suggested, the Sorry, legislature. Who? Who? Cliff Straken. Oh, Cliff, yep. Um, Hello, the, Provo. The legislature should Other also Provo. consider. I've got Provo in the room, and I've got Provo over here. <laughs> Lots of Provo. <laughs> um, the legislature should also consider the ability of someone to change careers, e.g. someone going working in a uh, government after being, uh, being able to become a teacher. Oh, sorry, that's really weird, hearing my voice while I talk. <laughs> um, let me try this again. The legislature should also consider the ability of someone to change careers, someone go, uh, working in government, being able to become a teacher after retirement. So that sort of um, lateral transfer rather than just transferring from an agency to agency, I think. Excellent point. Excellent point. Okay, well, the questions on the board, we will be emailing out to you, but just out of curiosity, quick show of hands, how many of your cities have raised public safety wages? And I'll actually expand that question public safety wages or benefits in the last two budget cycles. Okay, so just looking around the room, uh, it's probably 80% of the people in the room, I'd ask people to raise their hands online, but my, I'll let you figure that out, Carson. Um, but that's the sort of data we want to collect because I think we'll help this overall conversation about how, how do we better expand the pool. Scott. I know for us, um, I mean, we gave increases to the rest of our employees too but public safety got more than the rest of our employees. Gotcha. And so to say the wages went up two budget cycles, that's probably the same for every employee in every city. But for some, uh, it was more for public safety than for others. So that, a little bit of a distinction there. Okay, perfect. Well, we'll add that nuance when we send out the follow-up uh, follow request for information. Perfect, okay. Before I jump into the, the next item, the, out of curiosity, how many people in the room are here for their first LPC? So at least, yeah, right, yeah, right, raise it high. Perfect, well, welcome. Uh, mm -hmm. We're excited to have you. Uh, Liam, can you just take the mics to both of them and say quickly, uh, introduce themselves and what cities they're from. So one in the back and then one, one in the front. Um, as Liam does that, welcome to the Legislative mm -hmm. Policy Committee. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Alejandro Puy. Uh, I'm an elected council member for District 2 in Salt Lake City, which is the west side, Poplar Grove, Glendale area, half of Fair Park. Perfect. Congratulations. And then up here in the front. I'm Kathleen Alder. I'm just newly elected to Providence um, mayor. Perfect. So, perfect. Looking forward to collaborating with everyone. Um, we had a very contentious Proposition One mm -hmm. in our town, and you know what can we do to keep that away? That it wasn't a very good deal. The proposition one that the that the mayor elect is referencing was a land use referendum around higher density housing. Uh, so, I actually just looked looking around the room. I saw several people grimace. So they, you know, they they feel your pain and and right, terrific. Well, as you know, we're going to have a major transition. Um, congrats to those of you who are who are newly elected, and uh, thank you to those of you who will not be in office anymore come January. Thank you for your service. We'll have one more LPC in December. That's when we'll do the, the formal send-off for those who are members of the LPC and, and are leaving. Uh, but I wanted to make sure to acknowledge the, the two new ones who are here today. And then just consider that a reminder for those of you who are still going to be here in January to make sure your city updates your voting members so that we hit the ground running with the legislative session. Okay, a quick recap of the LPC growth policy survey that over 100 cities uh, responded to during the summer. This is what we sent out in August. We, we have used those survey responses extensively over the last few weeks on a variety of issues. Uh, the range in score was very comfortable, it was a plus two, very concerned was a negative two. The, then we broke down, I'm, you know, I'm not expecting you to be able to read this, but this is a breakdown of every topic that was listed there based on most comfortable to most concerning and then the the topics that were in the middle either somewhat comfortable somewhat concerning or ones split down the middle according to those scores internally we also broke it down by caucus so we have big cities established mid-sized cities rapid growth cities um, resort communities and rural utah as well so i give that to you as background because I actually keep a copy of those survey results in my bag with me everywhere I go so that as we're having conversations on different policy topics I can refer to it to see how they could potentially impact different classifications of cities. I bring that up because the league board just spent over 70 minutes this morning discussing the the latest on retail incentives and it is not our intent to rehash that here. Instead, yeah exactly right, yeah I, every board member just like Laugh, like, yeah, you're welcome. But I do want the rest of you who are not on the board to know that, that the league board came prepared today and we had a very productive dialogue with the governor's office of economic opportunity. So for 70 minutes, back and forth discussion over what should, what should the objective of the retail incentives language be, what should the definitions of retail be, what sort of incentives, what would it mean for infrastructure, uh, what is the housing component and what the definitions there are, uh, so on and so forth. So I, I bring this up mainly as a check-in with the LPC because the UEOC Sustainable Community Subgroup put out their first draft two weeks ago today, which we presented to the board this morning. Uh, the board did not take a formal position on it, but the board certainly made their, their opinions known about, about that preliminary draft. The Rep. Ben Hart, who is the Deputy Director of the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity, engaged in that dialogue for 70 some odd minutes. Uh, we will be summarizing all of the feedback from the League Board in these different topics as we work on essentially a counter proposal to that first draft. The Sustainable Community Subgroup will be meeting tomorrow. Mayor Ramsey and I will be there, as well as Marlon Eldred from Lehigh City, as the three local government reps there. And then the subgroup will meet again in a couple of weeks. And then we'll have the board meeting in the middle of December, the league board meeting in the middle of December. So timing wise, the plan is to bring back a proposal to the league board in the middle of December for the league board to vote on prior to the full commission meeting right after the new year in preparation for the session. What does that mean for the LPC? What that means for the LPC is first, the feedback you've provided to us over the last few weeks has really been invaluable. So. Uh, JJ, I, are you here, or maybe, there you are, in the back, okay. So for example, JJ, I've taken the examples that you provided us after the last LPC, 
and we've shared them with multiple stakeholders at the state level, some of which came up again today. Uh, Mayor Arvey, your city manager, Ken Leatham provided some examples that I've taken back to the, the sustainable community subgroup and said, basically, what is this? Why is the state trying to preclude this type of placemaking in North Salt Lake or in Clearfield or, or other communities? So what we still need from this group is to continue to provide feedback around, around these issues, either things that concern you or areas where you feel like there's some common ground. Because ultimately, the board tasked us as staff to work with the governor's office of opportunity and legislators to bring back a proposal for them to vote on in December. Now, whether they support that proposal is, you know, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Uh, any board members have anything you want to add from this morning's conversation for the rest of the LPC? Mayor Silvestrini? So, so I just want to add, I guess, to reassure everybody that, um, that our league board is made up of uh, really broad representation of communities around our state. We have big cities, we have little cities, towns, and, uh, you know, these, these proposals, you know, may affect different communities, you know, differently. So our, our discussion, I think, encompassed all of, all of those different impacts that, um, that uh, so it's a pretty broad-based discussion that we had. And then uh, the other thing I'll say is that, uh, I think the writing is on the wall that something is going to come out of uh, or be proposed to the legislature <clears throat> this session, which is going to be a major policy um, change for Utah in terms of how uh, we do or maybe more accurately how we don't do retail incentives. Um, you know, and uh, and the discussion we had in the board is pretty much this. You know, we we are fine with um, <clears throat> outlawing the concept of municipalities competing with each other to attract big box retail, okay? Um, big box retail being broadly defined as a Costco, a grocery store, a car dealer. Um, you know, that kind of competition isn't healthy and it doesn't necessarily serve a public purpose. And, 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 and our, our, you know, the league has to also be concerned about its political capital. How much can we, you know, reform or or affect a proposal before we run out of uh, a political capital at the, on the Hill and, and, and we're just the people that say no to everything. Mm -hmm. um, so we are trying to be constructive on this. We're trying to find some middle ground, but we are also jealous about protecting the ability of all kinds of local communities to, to protect placemaking, to protect uh, uh, you know, historic downtown uh, rehabilitation, and to also uh, help us use incentives to accomplish the goals of the Wasatch Choice 2050 plan, which is, you know, the, the concept of different options for different communities, but fundamentally, you know, we want to maximize our transit assets by building density where it makes sense, not putting it where it doesn't make sense, but we need to have some flexibility on that. That's what we're, that's what we're push, going to be pushing for. So we had a, a vigorous discussion about that, and, you know, basically what, what we're, I think, being advised is there is going to be a sea change on this, and it's going to just be our ability to try to shape it into something that, that uh, gives us the, the flexibility to do what we do best as local governments, which is, mm -hmm. is, which is to, to um, you know, address our own communities that we know best um, in, in ways that improve the, the you know, living conditions for our residents and still, and still be able to handle all the growth that we're facing. The only other thing I would add to that is um, not about retail incentives, but it's, it's significant that came out as a motion that was unanimously approved of our last UEOC board meeting. And it's something we've been asking for, uh, several of us, I think, a lot of us have been asking for the whole time I've been here. <clears throat> Excuse me. And that's for a state-led messaging campaign to help Utahns understand the reality of the growth that we are going to continue to experience where it comes from that we can't stop it and that what we need to do is work very hard to plan and be proactive, listen to what residents want and do, uh, do it in, in a way that does not compromise the quality of life, life that we live, that we love here in Utah as more people choose to move here and as our own children grow up and have grandchildren and, and as our, our families grow up. Anyway, we've been asking for that for quite some time. The Governor's Office of Planning and Budget is going to take the lead on that. We did approve that and, and directed that 
to the staff for Governor's Office of Planning and Budget to proceed with taking the lead on that. They'll be working closely with Envision Utah. There will be messaging that go, will go out. But it is, it is, in my opinion, past time and a very welcome decision to finally have the state choosing to take the lead because as local governments, we all know, people have been concerned about growth for quite some time and having some help with a statewide initiative to at least listen to uh, the kind of things we're hearing from the residents in our communities and then also um, to lead out on some of the messaging. That's a big one and that was unanimously supported. So we're happy about that. Thank you, Mayors. Uh, I grabbed my computer because I was taking notes furiously during the during the board meeting, and I wanted to highlight one of the what I think was really the biggest takeaway from that meeting this morning with the board. We had multiple board members ask point blank, "What are we trying to accomplish here?" So, if the state wants to curtail local governments using incentives, why and you know, what is acceptable and what is what is unacceptable going forward? And as part of that conversation, the, the discussion pivoted to this conversation of the broader public purpose. So what is the public purpose in Mill Creek City or South Jordan City offering an incentive? Is that, in, there's a perception that, well not perception, is the reality that if you give an incentive to a business, you're creating a competitive advantage for that business over a business that doesn't get the incentive. Conversely, if a city partners with a with a business for infrastructure investment or partners to adapt a, an old building for adaptive reuse or has a place making outcome or broader public purpose shouldn't that be part of the objective of why cities are in economic development in the economic development space to begin with so it led to a really good conversation of trying to narrow the focus on exactly what it is we're trying to accomplish as i've mentioned before the state is curtailing their entire EdTIF tool. So whereas before, really up until this coming January, the state could offer an EdTIF, which is their state um, incentive tool, to really any sort of business under the sun to locate anywhere. They are scaling that back considerably to where it'll only be focused now on five industries, and there'll be a location component as to where EdTIF can be utilized. So as the state is scaling back their incentive tools, they want to scale back the local incentive tools as well. And we've been trying to focus around that, okay, what's the, what's the broader public purpose for why we use some of these incentive tools? So I'm gonna pause there, see if there are any questions from anybody in the room or online. Any other comments from any board members who were there this morning? Going once. Going twice. Mayor liked. Yep, Liam. I just want to say thank you to the board for interceding with the governor to say we need more help from the governor's office. Not in the form of um, saying cities have to have X amount of, of high density housing, but we we really need an information campaign out there because every single city has to reinvent the wheel every single time somebody wants a developer wants to do high density and it it really becomes a divisive thing in every town and so i appreciate the board going forward with the governor and asking for that kind of help perfect well thank you for bringing that up because within the lpc survey results that we collected from you the number one item across the board was this sort of engagement effort with the public the number two item was actually increased technical assistance to help communities implement the plans in a way that balances the quality of life of today's residents and tomorrow's residents and helps people understand that you can actually, if we, if we plan appropriately, you can mitigate some of the perceived negative impacts from growth. Go ahead. We have a question online from Paul Larson. Is this a case of needing to align what we mean and what the UEOC means? It sounds like in some places we are saying the same things just in different jargon. Yeah, so Paul from Brigham City, thank you for bringing that up. And I, certainly in the infrastructure piece, I felt like by the end of today's meeting, the, the uh, Ben from the governor's office and the league on definition of infrastructure was, was closer than we were when we started. Because I think, I think there was kind of the perception Perception was there, the, the language just wasn't. On some of these others, I, I don't think we're there yet, 
uh, I think it does come back to what are we trying to accomplish here. Okay, any other comments? On the technical assistance piece? Mm -hmm. Yep, I, I will work that in here on MIHP Plus. So we brought this to you last month, um, SB 34 Plus. As a reminder, here's some relevant LPC survey results, really showing that there was support to varying degrees for state incentives for cities to plan for and allow for um, affordable housing zoning overlays or residential density and commercial zones or even duplexes and triplexes and single family zoning. So those are the results you gave us. You also see a stark difference between incentives and requirements. Uh, this, so Mayor Ramsey was just talking about the technical assistance piece. The number two scoring response from the LPC survey was additional technical assistance uh, to help communities implement plans. And, uh, and we've been pushing hard through the governor's office of planning and budget to get that funded in the governor's budget and then uh, within, within the legislature. So based on the discussion we had last month at, at LPC and then feedback from a lot of individual cities, uh, the current version of SB 34 plus um, that's moving forward really accomplishes those five things. Uh, tightening the language in the menu with a focus on implementation, creating a, a tougher annual deadline, um, creating new state incentives for compliance with SB 34 plus, working in the state funding for the technical assistance, and then improving the annual report so it actually says something that is relevant and meaningful for policy for local policymakers. Uh, we have been battling back and forth this fall with the Property Rights Coalition. What they would like to see in an SB 34 plus model would be to withhold B and C funds from cities if you're not compliant with SB 34, um, allow for the ability to sue for damages. So if Pleasant Grove or or uh, uh, South Weaver were not compliant with SB 34, that someone could bring litigation against you and seek damages, uh, or potentially prohibit cities from using econ economic development tools like CRAs if you're not compliant with, with SB 34. Um, at, at, we actually, in our LPC survey, asked the question about number one, withholding BNC funds, and it scored, no surprise, very negatively. Uh, so that one has been an automatic no, and we fought back on that at the Land Use Task Force last week. Um, the other two items were, were new last week, so we let them make their pitch, and then our negotiating team within the Land Use Task Force uh, will consider these later this week. We wanted to bring these forward to you because our assumption is still that we would be opposed to items two and three on the, on the PRC list. But to give you a sense of where the dialogue is going around SB 34+, I did present the concept of SB 34 plus to the Unified Economic Opportunity Commission last week, and we'll be presenting it to the Commission on Housing Affordability tomorrow. Uh, I'll pause there. Uh, thoughts or questions about SB 34 plus, either the version with the five bullet points, which is what's currently in there, or the version with the three bullet points, which is not yet in there, and we've been fighting those off. <laughs> so the uh, the question from uh, Councilmember Brad Sean Bountiful was, could we sue developers? Uh, here's one of the pieces of the report. So it doesn't get to your question on the, the litigation piece because we're just trying to avoid the litigation piece altogether. But on the re the current report, how many of you in this room have have actually filled out that report? Okay, so one about five of you. Okay. So as we reached out to the Utah chapter of the American Planning Association for feedback about the report, part of the concern was that the report right now is not formatted and is not asking the, the right questions to actually give a real story of what's happening in your community. So Kate, I'll use Bountiful as an example. It's hard to glean from the report that Bountiful is taking these proactive steps in a variety of places in the city. So what we want to do by changing that report and the requirements in the report is actually make it easier for Bountiful or Logan or others to tell your story of what you're doing, which also includes how the development community is responding to how you're planning in your city. Because ultimately, 
bountiful plan plants for housing, but bountiful doesn't build housing. And so how is the private sector responding to how you're planning? And that would be a very useful data point that currently isn't being collected. So I thought I saw, yep, Council Member Shelton Sojo. Yes, thanks Cameron. I, I uh, reviewed recently the list of options that you send out in a Friday Facts, you send mm -hmm. a link to the yep. list of options. I reviewed through that and um, I mean, there were a couple of things that just really stuck out to me. One is that uh, the legislature is looking for a shift of the cost of the impact from those that are coming in new to those who are already there. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, taking away impact fees or, or uh, having general fund pay for the cost of uh, subsidizing housing or or different impacts. That's that's one thing that occurred to me, but the, the question that just rang in my mind, and I don't know how we answer this, but I want you to know it's ringing in my mind, is okay, if a city does these things that theoretically will have some reduction in the cost of producing housing, will that actually reduce the cost of housing to the consumer? Mm -hmm. Or will it just increase the profits to the developer? So I'm going to have to give a great shout out to the Southwest Valley right now between Mayor Burton's million dollar question on retirement and now uh, Council Mayor Shelton's million dollar question on, uh, on housing. So, right, so back, back in May, because you're asking the exact right question, right? Who pays for growth and who benefits from whatever policy lever we pull. Back in May, the League Board prioritized a handful of different policy or potential policy tools, but even before they did that, they listed some key principles and the principle you just described was right at the top of the list. That whatever lever gets pulled needs to actually benefit the potential home buyer uh, and that, that needs to be the ultimate focus. This, one of the other principles was the one you mentioned at the beginning of your comment, which is that balance of who pays for growth, current residents versus future residents, and making sure we've got, we have the right balance there. Uh, so the answer to your question is we're very cognizant of those two principles, and the hope within SB 34 plus is that there's still sufficient flexibility for a city to, to pick what makes the most sense in their community, and if that doesn't include, say, waiving impact fees because of the growth pressures you have in your community and there's no other revenue streamed off, so that's fine. Um, but if it does mean in your community that you're going to use RDA dollars for, to help buy down the cost of housing, you should get credit for that. So you know, the, the flexibility that's built into SB 34 is trying to acknowledge all those differences and avoid the California approach, which is just simply thou shalt do these things and not really think about what those consequences are on all communities. Mayor Lecht, and then you have a comment on line two, Jim. Really the only way to, to guarantee that it, that it reduces for the home buyer is if the money goes to the home buyer. Because mm -hmm. if you put it in the system, the potential for someone to abuse that and to make more profit and not, not lower the price for the end user is, is so, so much greater than if it just goes directly to the home buyer. Yeah, you're right. And the market forces are incredibly hot right now. Uh, so the, the project that I was referencing earlier in South Jordan is actually a, a project that required deed restrictions in order to ensure that that benefit made it all the way to the, to the end home buyer. All right, um, we have two questions here. The first from Lanise Davenport. The modern income housing report sets cities up for failure. It is not an accurate reflection of what cities are doing. It does not assist cities in working through our housing needs and it uses old and inadequate data. And then the second question. So let me just pause okay. there. Amen, Lanise, and that's why part of the focus of SB 34 plus is to fix all of those things. All right, and then the second question from Valerie Clausen is, um, as a city, we were never bound to responding to just what that was on the report. 
Part of the planning professional's job would be to tell the state the whole story even if the blanks on the form didn't have enough space. So I have major concerns that these attempts at making reporting easier will create a greater burden on city staff for reporting. Cities, have, cities will have unique responses based on their situation. Yeah, amen on, on the last piece, on, Valerie, on the, on the um, unique circumstances in, in each city. And this is also in part why the technical assistance piece is critical. Because as we met with planners over the course of the last few months, we met with planners from, from medium and large cities who said there are menu items that our policymakers are interested in, but we don't know how to implement them. So having some technical assistance to help us implement these menu items would be really valuable. So that's where you know, part of making this whole thing work is making sure we have access to those resources. We're still working through with the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget about how that money gets to cities, whether that's through the AOGs, like Mountainlands and Wasatch Front Regional Council and, and Bear River and others, or if it goes through the MPOs, which are, there's overlap, but not necessarily the same, or if it comes through GOPB. So stay tuned on, on those details, but, but that is a, a critical piece. Uh, just one last comment from Paul Larson. It could be simplified by asking, what have you done over the last year to implement Senate Bill 34? Well, so Lenise and Paul and Valerie and others, when we, when we get to the drafting phase here, we'll be relying heavily on the planners who have been doing those reports to make sure we're setting it, setting it up correctly. Uh, the last thing I'll add to here is another key component of SB 34 plus is the idea that if Saratoga Springs is going above and beyond the call of duty. Right now, Saratoga Springs uh, doesn't, have, doesn't have any fixed rail or transit and probably won't for the next 200 years. <laughs> Too soon, right? Too soon. <clears throat> and so Saratoga Springs is responsible to do three menu items, whereas uh, South Jordan, which has fixed rail in the city, is required to do four. But if Saratoga and South Jordan go above and beyond and get above five or six, uh, then you would get additional prioritization for the state ARPA dollars or for consideration by the Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity. So that's, that's another piece of this as well. And so Mayor Silvestrini, we would, uh, Carson, are you gonna do a, a poll online? Okay, so what we, would, what we would welcome is essentially confirmation that this is the right direction for us to continue proceeding uh, before we have to present to the Commission on Housing Affordability tomorrow, and, and there's just a lot of moving pieces over the next few weeks. So this was kind of the last checkpoint on the concept so that we can keep negotiating on the details. So uh, somebody want to make a motion to support the direction that staff is undertaking with us on these issues? Second. I heard a second. Uh, yeah, Kate Bradshaw. Okay, so Gil Miller with the motion. All right. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Okay. Carson, I assume you opened the voting and a poll. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, I am almost done. Then I'll turn it over to Justin. The. State funding request, this actually is going to be the biggest year in my career of requesting dollars from the state of Utah for cities in general. Okay, we don't get involved in specific appropriations for Murray or Providence, but what we, what we are starting to do is try to get more involved in the general appropriations that benefit cities as a whole. So I already mentioned the technical assistance piece. There are likely going to be some initiatives in the air quality space. Um, some of your cities are on a short list to be part of a pilot program for a local road usage charge. Um, the opioid settlement, uh, the league board gave us direction this morning and we've been coordinating with the Municipal Attorneys Association there. Uh, the mitigation fund, this is the homelessness mitigation fund, the league board adopted a few weeks ago or endorsed a request for five million in state dollars to go into the homelessness mitigation fund. Molly will uh, touch on that later. And then the local match expansion. There were uh, we had $50 million worth of money. I was on the selection committee, which was both, I was fortunate and unfortunate to be on there because we only funded about 4.5% of all of the projects that came before us. The league board this morning uh, uh, endorsed a request to the legislature to expand that local match part two and funded at a higher level in the upcoming session. Um, the speaker 
of the House has indicated he would like to see a housing affordability component as part of Local Match Part 2, which overlaps with what I was just describing with, with MIHP Plus and SB 34 Plus. So the other land use related items, this is, this is now just update only. Uh, we are sending information and to the attorneys and planners in your city that are part of our broader land use task force home team. But these are the four items that are still out there for deliberation within the Commission on Housing Affordability, and well, uh, some of which may appear in a bill over the next few weeks. So if your city is interested in inclusionary zoning, um, standing for annexation petitions, uh, the fixing of the uh, subdivision vesting language from House Bill 409 last year, or some sort of notice or appeal process for uh, local development standards, with that I'm talking about road width or road base or other things, please make sure you notify league staff today or in the next few days. Our negotiating team, which includes many of your attorneys, will be meeting later this week as we're working th through these proposals that have been coming from the Property Rights Coalition. So we'll bring it back for your vote later, but we wanted to basically give you notice that these are the items that are still out there from our summer of negotiations with the land use within the Land Use Task Force. So with that, Justin, I will turn it over to you, and uh, thank you for the time, and go Utes. Okay. All right, hello. Um, so I'm sure many of you are aware there's a special legislative session last week, um, and the big thing was redistricting. They redrew all the maps um, and voted on them and passed them. So what I'm, what I'm going to show you really quickly, I'm going to jump um, out of the PowerPoint and jump online really quick here, is how to find the maps if you have not found them yet. Because um, it took me a while to find them this morning, so I'm going to show you how I did it. You can go to le.utah.gov slash redistricting maps, um, or if you just go straight to the Utah Legislature's website, Go to resources, and then up at the top here, there are view redistricting maps. And that will take you right back to where we were. Now you would think, you're not seeing it? Oh man, let me see if we can fix that. That's weird. Let's see if I kill that, will it show? Let me see if I kill this, that'll do it. Oh, hold on, I'm gonna be right there. So I just, I just want to say, if any of you uh, are interested in, really, in seeing the real four corners of Utah, come to Mill Creek. We're, I think we're the only community that is now in all four congressional districts. So we have four doors open to us now. So look, at, look out all of those congressional reps. All right, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure why it's not showing. That would have been way too easy, right? Well, I'll, I'll walk you through this, okay? This is going to be a podcast now um, without, without audio. Slowly, though, if you go to le.utah.gov, bottom left corner, I don't know why it's showing, I apologize, it says resources. Okay? It will take you to the quick links. In the center column, there is a link that says view redistricting maps. Okay? Click on that. It will then take you to the different maps. So I'll tell you the ones that other than what Mayor Silvestrini said, because his city did get four congressional districts, congratulations. Um, those are not the ones I actually care about that much. Um, if you click on Utah State House Boundaries, for example, HP 2005, um, you would think the bill could just have a map, but that would be way too simple. Um, look at the right-hand side of the bill, and there's going to be some links. It will say related documents, and under related documents, it will say link to map. That is where you can finally actually see that map. So again, I know that was really, really fast, really easy, but if you click on, once you get to the bill page, this is maybe the big takeaway, once you get to the actual bill page, look under related documents and link to map, and then you can actually see the map. Um, then, what I would like you all to do, and you don't have to do it right now, um, but if you have not yet looked at the maps, please take a moment and do go look at those maps. Um, why? Because you're going to have new legislative districts that cover your city. And you're going to have new legislators, not just yet, but next year, new legislators that are going to cover your cities and towns. So please take a look at those maps so you can start getting to know who's going to be covering your, your city 
You may have new relationships you need to build. Um, so please, please take a look at those maps so we can get ahead of that. Yeah. Yeah, that is a great point. You may have the exact same legislator, but you may have a different district number. They did go uh, renumber a lot of those. So uh, just a reminder, please, as we're, as we're working with legislators, and a great time uh, to be talking to the legislators is um, when they're actually running, before they become a legislator sometime. So please, please go look at those maps. Um, please, please get to know who the new legislators are going to be, um, or same legislators with a different number. And let's see if this wants to, yeah, perhaps. That is correct. So the new maps do not change anybody's representative or senator right now. They will declare for candidacy starting in January if they're going to gather signatures and then in March when they actually declare candidacy. Um, but then those, those offices will not be in place until January of 2023. Yeah, great clarification. Thank you. I don't know why it doesn't want to mirror my screen anymore at all. But the slides are less exciting at this point. Okay, once you're there. All right. We're going to jump back through really quick. The other uh, quick update I just have is there have already been a couple of legislative uh, changes in the last couple of weeks. Uh, Representative Craig Hall out of West Valley um, stepped down from the legislature and became a judge up in the second district. Um, fun fact about uh, Representative Hall as I tackled him once in a game of softball. Uh, executive branch versus legislative branch, so I hope I never end up in his court for anything. Um, but in, in House District 33, uh, Judy Weeks Rohner is the new uh, representative there. So anybody out in, in House District 33, um, you want to pay attention to that one for at least a year. And then in House District 65, Francis Gibson stepped down, and Stephen White is the new uh, representative there, which also led to a change in House leadership. Uh, so just so you're aware, Mike Schultz is now the majority leader. And because Francis Gibson stepped down, Mike Schultz went into that spot. And Jefferson Moss is now the majority whip. So if you're keeping track of who the, the leadership up in the House is there, that's, that's the new one. So those are the quick updates from me, things that are going down on the Hill. But again, please really do uh, go look at those maps. Um, if you can find them, if you need help, I can walk you through. I know how to find them now. But we do want to make sure that, that before January of next year, you are aware of what districts are covering your cities so you can start making those connections with the new legislators. Thank you. And then, Mayor, I can just kick it to Carson if he's gonna jump up real quick. And then, Molly, you're gonna be up right after that. Thanks, Justin, and thank you, everybody. Um, as many of you know, the short-term rental working group, we started, uh, uh, earlier this fall, the group's met twice now, discussing sort of high-level policy topics, and then starting to dive into the, the preliminary data a little bit. Uh, for those of you who haven't been as involved in LPC previously, earlier this summer we contracted with the Gardner Policy Institute to conduct a um, conduct a inventory of all of the short-term rental units listed in the state of Utah. So not just the licensed units, not just the unlicensed units, but everything. Um, we're expecting that uh, public version of that document to be available pretty soon. Um, so this group's been working on how to best message that data and understand that data, making sure we're asking the right questions, and then trying to transfer that data and others into a coherent policy. Now, I've, I've listed the sort of high-level objectives that the group has identified. Uh, first, maximize the availability of long-term housing units. One thing that we've seen is a significant uptick in the number of short-term rentals. As all of you know, we've, uh, we seem to be having a housing unit shortage, particularly in the rental space. So one of the goals is to figure out how to make, uh, to incentivize landlords to uh, have long-term tenants, especially in resort communities, so workforce housing tenants, rather than just vacation homes. Um, second, level the playing field between short-term rental owners and hotels to make sure everybody's com uh, sort of competing on the same field. And then finally, minimize the impacts on communities. Again, this, there's an acute impact on um, resort communities, but I think we're starting to see more and more of this in all across the state. So our, our sort of ask will be to try to identify the number of licensed short-term rentals in your community. Uh, originally, when uh, the um, Representative Notwell's bill was passed a few years ago, the concern was that municipalities would just not be 
uh, permitting short-term rentals whatsoever. I don't believe that's the case. We've seen a lot of licensed units around the state. So um, one of our next objectives will be in the data space will be to demonstrate that cities are in fact licensing short-term rentals and that cities are open to short-term rentals and we just need to try to uh, work with our other stakeholders to figure out a good balance. Um, that's all I have. Are there any questions on short-term rentals? Great. Well, the group will be continuing to meet until the session, so if you have any feedback, feel free to reach out to me and I'll, um, I'll bring you up to speed on specifics. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I think I've had the chance to meet most, well, not face to face meet, face to face meet you, but my name is Molly Wheeler. I'm the new director of policy at the League and looking forward to working with you all. One of the projects I've been working on thus far is looking at the Homeless Mitigation Fund um, and some of the challenges that lie within it. So right now, there's a this year, there's about $6.1 million available to reimburse those cities with homeless resource centers, as well as the other grant eligible entities. However, um, there was about $11.5 million in funding requests, and those funding requests don't even speak to the entire um, cost of housing those resources within those localities. So we're working on that. Um, Niederhauser is requesting $5 million for the Homeless Mitigation Fund in ongoing money from the general fund, um, in addition to his $100 million for deeply affordable housing. So that would get the mitigation fund up to about $11.1 .1 million. The ULCT board has approved this request. Um, additionally, Cam and I will be meeting with Niederhauser and his team later today to continue to work out some other issues, but we have nothing for you to consider or vote on yet, but just wanted to give you an update on where we are with this. Are there any questions? Roger is remote, so I will do this for uh, Roger rather than having the voice of Roger uh, somehow work through the system here. Uh, the last item is on opioids. Here's what you need to know. If you are a city of more than 10,000, between now and the end of the year, you will need to consider signing on to the state's potential settlement with the opioid manufacturers to maximize the amount of money that the state of Utah would be eligible for. Now, in short, there's $150 million that the state of Utah would receive on their own if the settlement offer uh, was only signed by the state. If all 29 counties and all cities above 10,000 sign on, that pool can expand to $270 million, distributed over 18 years. JJ. It depends on your form of government. So the Attorney General's office has not asked for a specific, uh, a specific mechanism, so it really will depend on how you do it as a city. Now, oh, Lynn. This is exciting. I love questions about legal mechanisms. Uh, I joined in the meeting you had League hosted last week about this, and I appreciate that. That was very helpful. Since then, I have learned that the real fight here doesn't have anything to do with cities. Right. Uh, and this is really a quarrel between the counties and the state as to who gets how much money. Uh, but as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong here, so, but as I understand it, if cities sign on, if we opt into the settlement, the pool of available money grows from 150 million to 270 million. Correct. So there's no reason not for us, for us not to sign on. Correct. Um, but either way, it's just a question of whether that, how much goes to the state and how much goes, goes to the county. From my own perspective, um, you know, speaking as the Salt Lake County community, we will get a lot more benefit out of the money that goes to the county than the money that goes to the state. But that's a dialogue they're having internally. But I think it's in all of our interest collectively to make sure we get 270 million rather than 150 million. But that requires us to opt in. So that's Correct. just my yep. comment. Yep, well said. He referenced a call that we held last week with the Municipal Attorneys Association because we've been trying to keep your attorneys 
briefed of the status here so that when it gets to the elected officials and the administrators, uh, you, you know, your attorneys, are, your attorneys are up to speed on it. We were supposed to meet with UAC at 3.30 today. That meeting has now been postponed. So sorry about the frantic urgency I had at the end of the board meeting. Uh, it's been postponed to Thursday. But nevertheless, uh, you will be seeing that information coming to your cities in the next few weeks to sign on. We have to hit an 86% population threshold. So for example, if Salt Lake County chooses not to sign on, then there's really no point in anybody else signing on because Salt Lake County would bring us down below the population threshold. Um, UAC had their conference last week. All 29 counties are involved in litigation with the opioid manufacturers. So th they had their outside counsel there and it was, a, it was a very productive meeting, but they haven't made their final decision yet on whether or not to sign on. They plan to do that in the next few days. Once they do that, then it's our turn as cities. That's step one. Step two is how the money ultimately gets spent. This is not a scenario where there's going to be a formula to ensure that Clearfield and Holiday and Sandy all get a certain amount of money. That's not how this is going to work. Instead, you'll have a county pool of money and a state pool of money. And what we asked of the board this morning and, the, and they adopted was basically say there need to be some guardrails in how the money is allocated to make sure that cities have a seat at the table, whether that's the county table or the state table. For example, for cities that house homeless resource centers or for cities that have any sort of opioid mitigation uh, programming or for training for first responders, the settlement agreement actually outlines what you can spend the money on. So this is not a negotiation of what we can and can't do. It's in the four corners of that document. But there are a few things that cities could potentially use that money on. So we just want to make sure that at the state level and at the county level, cities have a chance to speak up for those funds. But there would not really be any guarantee that Bountiful and Riverton get a dollar and a dollar based on population. So you may, realistically, many of your cities may sign on to an agreement that won't bring a dollar to your budget, but will bring a benefit to the community and maximize the benefit to the state. So. Any questions on opioids? Is that Roger asking me a question or is it somebody else? Uh, it's Ken Leatham. Okay, Ken's good. I <laughs> figure if it's Roger, he's going to correct me on something. Um, <laughs> Ken Leatham asked, when is the deadline for signing on to the settlement? Oh, so that is a moving target. If you had asked a few weeks ago, I would have, would have had a different answer. What I think the new answer is, is January 2nd or January 3rd, the, the Monday. Um, initially, we were told it was the first week in December. But it looks like right now, at least as of our last meeting, that it'll be the first week in January. Realistically, for those of you who have to run it through a public process, you know, the time's ticking because uh, you're not going to meet after mid-December. So, so Ken, as soon as possible, but we have nothing to deliver to you yet to consider. No, I, I was going to suggest that, uh, just because I like to give you more work, Cameron, but... Uh, yes. You know, it may be useful if the if the league were to send out a, a sample resolution to all of the members to make it just easier, so we get that done and with a with some kind of an explanation just about when when it's due. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, Roger, we well, we can work on that. Roger's been our our point person on this. I also want to thank <clears throat> Salt Lake City Attorney Katie Lewis, Midvale City Attorney uh, Lisa Garner, South Salt Lake City Attorney Josh Collins, and Ogden City Attorney Gary Williams because we didn't want just Roger and me in these meetings. We wanted to make sure we had some on the ground expertise from cities. Uh, so those four city attorneys have been in every meeting and have been very valuable as we've had these deliberations with the attorney general's office and with others. So thank you to those four cities for sharing your attorneys on a pretty hectic time frame the last few weeks. Okay, any other questions for me before I mercifully yield the floor? <laughs> thank you, okay. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Mary Silvestrina, I'll let you announce the upcoming events. And yeah, so uh, for, for, uh, for those of us that have uh, some newly elected officials or for those of us that might need a refresher course, um, the league offers, uh, is offering two different trainings. I think they're the same each, each time for newly elected officials, but there's one on December 11th at the U.S. U Extension, which I think is in Taylorsville. And then the... Broadcast the Pardon? Yeah, that one's that one's broadcast. But the one here, there's one here at this in this building on January 8th. I don't know if that's broadcast, but you can come here in person. So th I think those are valuable for for new people just to kind of uh, appreciate their roles and uh, and make life easier for the rest of us too. Um, and then uh, local officials' day is going to be at the Capitol on January 19th. So I think we're back to uh, 
back to some kind of normalcy on that with respect to uh, maybe youth councils and things like that up at the Capitol? Yeah, so, okay, one, two. Like, there's like at least 10, 15 of them anyway. Yeah. I'll just say that if, if you have a youth council, this is something that I think that they enjoy. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for them to meet some legislators and to kind of see what's going on, and it's a fun field trip, so. Okay, um, our next LPC meeting is uh, December 13th, 2021 here, and, uh, and then uh, we're gonna come up with a schedule for the meetings during the session and figure out where to, to meet uh, when we meet up at the Capitol, so. Is there any other business to come before the LPC? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. All in favor, we're out of here, thank you.